The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? I am your host, Soraya, and welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? Tonight's show is a pre-record. Um, I recorded this interview a few weeks ago with Penny Sartori. Uh, fascinating conversation. Really like this interview. Penny was very pleasant to talk with, and information is just fascinating. As I say in the interview, I highly recommend her book. Watch the YouTube and Vimeo pages for some uh, interviews and such that hopefully we recorded today at the Para Horror Conference uh, convention up in Buffalo. That should be some interesting stuff there, including, if all goes well, a, a, an interview with Lyle Blackburn, and plenty of other fun stuff coming up in the future. So, without any further ado, here's my interview with Penny Sartori. So, welcome to the show, Penny. How are you doing tonight? Hi, I'm good, thanks, and it's great to be here. And you're based out of the UK? Yes, I am. Okay, and... Uh, your book is entitled The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, How Understanding NDEs Can Help Us Live More Fully. And this is your second book, right? Yes, that's correct, yes. Now, the first one was the the work that you actually based this book on. Yes, that's right. That was based on the, uh, the research that I undertook in the hospital. And it's more of an academic book, really, so it costs... Um, a great deal of money, so it's best to borrow it from the library. But I wanted my work to be available, really, for everyone, so I decided then to write this second book so that it, it could sort of draw on the work that I've done, but also it could look at what I've learned through doing my work as well. Okay, and how did you get in... Uh... How did you get involved in studying near-death experiences? Well, I used to work as a nurse in the intensive care unit, and it was quite early on in my career when I was looking after a man who was clearly dying, and um, we, we made this connection, and it was during a night shift, and I felt as if I almost swapped places with this man, and I could feel what he was going through and what he could feel, and he was having quite a prolonged death, really, and it wasn't pleasant for him. And when we made that connection, it really had a profound impact on me. So I really wanted to change things so that future patients didn't have to go through the same things that he went through. So I started reading about death because I realized that we don't understand death. We don't really un understand fully the dying process. So I started researching what death is about. And then I came across near-death experiences. And I thought, you know, these sound really fascinating because people are telling us that death is a pleasant process and it's it's a very nice thing and I think my scientific training as a nurse made me a little bit skeptical of of these lovely stories of leaving the body and going through a dark tunnel towards the light and I thought well I'm working in the the perfect place really to study these experiences and so my curiosity got the better of me and I decided to undertake my own study then it, it seems like a lot of uh a lot of people who go into this as skeptics, if they study the near-death experience with an open mind, come out with a uh, come out as believers that this is a real experience. Yes, absolutely. I think it's certainly you, you, it's important to have an open mind because before I started studying them, I had these preconceptions that they were just hallucinations, you know, and I'd never studied them in depth, and I'd never spoken to people who'd had a near-death experience. So it was only after I started really engaging with people who've had the experience and studying it as well that I realized there's far more to these experiences than we realize. And what I was finding with my research is that these people were clearly having very vivid experiences when their brains were in a very dysfunctional state. Now that contradicts everything that I'd been taught. And so I think there's far more to near-death experiences than we realize. And I think it's important that we do continue to research them with an open mind. Right, right. And the... Uh... Because it seems like occasionally doctors and such will decide they're going to look more into this. And I've never heard of one of them coming away saying, no, no, it's just a hallucination. They always seem to have been won over 
by the experiences and realizing that there's no one simple explanation for these things. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of doctors now who are getting interested in studying near-death experiences, even doctors that I worked with as well. You know, in the beginning, they too were very skeptical, and in fact, some of them made f jokes about my research. But then as they realized my research was quite serious and they started taking notice, they too then seemed to have more of an open mind. So I think that's really important because for future patient care, it's really important that we understand these experiences and that we can support people who've had the experience as well. Now, these experiences are very different to different people, um, but what are some of the, the archetypes behind this? Like, what are the common factors that people tend to experience? Right, yeah, well, people kind of um, feel like they leave their body and look down on the emergency situation and they travel through perhaps a dark tunnel towards a bright light. And when they're in this light, they can meet deceased relatives or deceased friends, people sometimes they didn't know to be dead at the time of the experience. They can meet a religious figure, and that religious figure is influenced by their culture. So, for example, people in the West are more likely to see images of Jesus Christ, whereas people in India, for example, are more likely to see Yama, the God of the Dead, or Yama Dutz, his messengers, or even someone called Chitragupta, who is a man with a book of all the deeds of their life. Um, some people as well have a life review, where they can see the whole of their life flash before their eyes in a matter of seconds. And this is really interesting to me, because the life review kind of shows they relive everything that they've done almost in a matter of seconds and sometimes they can relive it from a third person perspective so they realize the impact of their actions on other people and that gives them a very different understanding of how they've behaved in their life as well so that's a really interesting aspect for me um, and a lot of people as well, they, they're sent back by the relatives and friends who tell them it's not their time, that they have to go back. But very often the people don't want to go back because they're very um, comfortable and there's no pain or anything. And it's a lovely, ecstatic experience. And then sometimes when people revive and, and wake up back in this life, sometimes there's some guilt associated with it because they were actually happy to stay where they were, despite the fact that they have family and maybe small children as well so it's a highly complex phenomenon you know yeah yeah um now you said sometimes they'll see dead relatives they didn't know are dead do you want to explain that a little yeah well some people for example um they, there was one man in my research for example and um during a night shift his condition had deteriorated quite rapidly so we'd called in the family the family came in and he'd been in intensive care for some weeks and the family were used to being called in and um, when they came and sat at his bedside he was deeply unconscious and then he started to stabilize so the family said look we, we've been here before several times we're really tired we're going to go home so the family went home and it must have been about 4 4 a.m and um, after they returned home my colleague called me and she said look at the patient and we were all watching him my colleagues and myself he was smiling at someone he'd suddenly kind of regained a bit of consciousness and he was smiling at someone we couldn't see and gesturing and talking to someone and um, we watched this for quite some time and he looked really happy and very content and then he, he just sort of stopped talking and then he went off to sleep. Now, the following day when I went into work, his family approached me and they said that um, as soon as they'd visited him this morning, he was quite animatedly trying to tell them something very excitedly that overnight he'd been visited by his dead mother and his dead grandmother. But he said, I don't understand this, but also his sister was with them. Now, unbeknown to him, his sister had actually died the week before, but the family hadn't told him. They didn't want him to know because they didn't want it to set back his recovery. So then he, you know, he saw his sister when he didn't know that she was dead. So that was quite an interesting case as well. Now, is that the only case of that you have in your particular research? In the particular hospital research that I came across, yes. But I've had many other cases of people writing to me and emailing me over the years. So I've got quite a database, really, of people who've had these kinds of experiences. Okay. Now, some people, although it's a minority, some people do have negative near-death experiences. 
Yes, they do. So some people feel that they can be quite distressed as a result of having these, um, their experience. Um, some people find the, the three different ways of categorizing these experiences. The first is the usual kind of experience, but it's interpreted in a very frightening way. The second type is what's called the void experience, and where this, the person feels that they're in this dark, eternal, meaningless void. And sometimes they can hear um, voices in the background saying that life is just a joke. And then the third type is where the people actually feel that they are going into hell or looking into hell. And that can be really traumatic for them as well. And particularly when they recover, even the recall of this third hellish type experience can be very distressing for them. And during my hospital research, I came across two people who'd had the distressing kind of experiences. The first one was a lady who had interpreted her experience in a frightening way. And the second one was a lady who'd had a cardiac arrest. And um, she recalls, actually, she felt that she was looking into hell. And when I began to question her further about this aspect, she became very, very distressed. And in fact, she became so distressed that I had to terminate the interview because she was almost on the point of hysteria and crying about it. So I went. To, I returned to see her about two two days later, and she sent me away. She said, "I don't want to talk about it because just thinking about it is really frightening me." So I think it's really important that we understand these experiences because we don't know how to support these patients once they've had the experience. And I can remember when I was a student nurse, I was looking after a lady, and um, she was dying, and she knew she was dying, but she was terrified. And every time that we walked past her bedside, she would try to jump out of bed, and she would try to grab hold of us and pull onto our uniforms and dig her nails into our flesh. And we, none of us could understand this. So we asked her family what had happened, you know, if they had any ideas. And they said that she died five years ago. She'd had a cardiac arrest and her heart had stopped five years ago. And But they didn't know why she was like this at the moment. Now, it's only on reflection since I've done my research. And looking back, perhaps this lady, when she had her cardiac arrest, had the distressing kind of experience and which led to her having this really terrify, terrifying process of death as she was dying. So I think it's so important that we research these further. What, do, what would you say the percentage of the negative near-death experiences are on the overall study? Uh, well, it depends really on whose research you look at, but the figures to date seem to suggest about 14% of all near-death experiences can be of the distressing kind. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, the, the life review, what kind of effect does the life review have on the person? Oh, that, that's really interesting because it really does have uh, big moral implications for them as well. So, for example, what, when they've, they're having this life review, they can see the whole of their life flash before their eyes. Now, this is the significant things and insignificant things, and they can see the good that they've done towards people, and they can see the bad that they've done towards people. And they feel that sometimes they relive it from a third-person perspective. So if they've been particularly kind to someone, they feel what it's like to receive that kindness. But conversely as well, if they've been unpleasant to someone or if they've been violent towards someone, they can feel like what it's like to be on the receiving end of that unpleasantness or that violence. For example, there's one um, case that uh, Professor Kenneth Ring has talked about, and this man um, actually punched someone, and during his life review, he felt like what it was like to be on the receiving end of that punch, and he felt it, the humiliation of being on the floor and things like that. So the life review really does make people consider their actions towards others as well, and when they come back to this life, they have a different perspective on how they do conduct themselves in life. And if this experience was a, a hallucination, that seems like it would be a, 
a pretty vivid thing for a dying brain to be able to show someone. Oh yes, absolutely. And and that's what I found, you know, with my when I worked as a nurse in the intensive care unit, I've looked after many, many patients who've been unconscious, you know, in the thousands over the seventeen years that I was there. And people when they're recovering from unconscious and severe brain uh, insults, they're usually quite confused and very vague about things yet the people who have the near-death experience report this really heightened state of awareness and they're very lucid and clear and precise about what they've experienced as well so there was a contrast between people who have just been normally unconscious and people who've had the near-death experience now there's i guess part of the problem is we have no way of verifying that what these people are experiencing is real, but we can to some degree verify their out-of-body state and what they're seeing in their out-of-body experience, can't we? Yes, that's right. Now, that's what I try to do with my research. Um, at every patient's bedside in the, in the ICU, I had these hidden symbols. Now, they were hidden on top of the cardiac monitors at each of the patient's bedside. And the only way that you could view these symbols was if you'd actually left your body. And what I came across in my research is that in the five years, I came across eight patients who'd had an out-of-body experience. But no one actually saw the symbols. Now, the reason for this is because the quality of the out-of-body experience varied considerably. Now, some of the people felt that they only raised about four foot above their bed, which wasn't high enough to view the symbols. Some people floated in directions opposite to, to where the symbol was situated. And there were two patients who had the out-of-body experience where they were in a position where they could have viewed the symbols, but both of those patients said that they were so concerned with what was going on around their body that they weren't looking anywhere else. So no one actually saw it. Yet I've also had some anecdotal cases from people who said that they've actually um, floated to specific parts of the room and they could see different things. So I think it, it needs a lot more research and a lot more time before we'll get more of these cases. So the good quality cases that we need, I think we'll need more time to accumulate them. But the people who have these out-of-body experiences, despite not seeing the symbol, can relate in great detail what's going on in the room at the time, can't they? Yes, absolutely. Um, patient 10 in my study was the strongest case that I came across, and he reported leaving his body at a time when he was deeply unconscious. He was not responding to deep painful stimuli, and he was not responding to us shaking him or calling him. And yet when he revived, he reported very accurately what the doctor had done, and which doctor had been examining him, not the other ones that he'd previously seen. He'd also described what the nurse did and what the physiotherapist did. And all of the, the events that he described from an out-of-body perspective occurred while he was deeply unconscious. Now, I know that this was correct because I was actually there at the time. I was the nurse who was looking after him, and what he reported was very accurate. And so that was something that really kind of made me think quite deeply because I think he actually believes that he was out, out of his body looking down, and, and it doesn't make sense because he was so deeply unconscious, yet he was having a very deep and precise lucid experience. Yeah, yeah, and some some people who have these experiences are essentially brain dead at the time, correct? Some of them are if they've had a cardiac arrest, especially if it's a prolonged cardiac arrest, yet they report these things which are in precise detail. So I think it's our understanding of consciousness that kind of perhaps needs to be revised more than anything because that doesn't make sense. If, if consciousness is produced by the brain, it doesn't make sense how people can have such a lucid and clear experience and report themselves as being out of their body while their brain is so severely dysfunctional. So I think we really need to have a look at consciousness, what it is, when it begins, and when it ends. Now, the... Uh the near-death experience can be had by somebody who's not actually dying at the time. Yes, that's right. This can happen in many different contexts. Um, it, it 
to be also called a spiritually transformative experience. And again, this is almost identical to a near-death experience, but it occurs in circumstances that are not close to death. And there are certain things that may trigger such an experience. For example, it can occur during a period of crisis in someone's life, after deep grief, um, or the belief that they they may be close to death as well. So, for example, um, back in the 1800s, um, Albert Heim did a study in mountain climbers who had fallen, and as they were fallen, they had this kind of life review as well. So it can happen in many contexts as well. Okay. Um, one of the other things that, that seems to provide some empirical proof is the side effects of the near-death experience, not just the the moral shift in the person, which wouldn't happen from a hallucination, but also they, they have some other unusual side effects, don't they? Yes, there's, there's loads of different um, side effects. So, for example, common ones are lack of fear of death and more compassion and love towards other people, less materialistic, things like that. But also there are some that are really fascinating to me. Now, the most fascinating to me is that some people report changes in their electromagnetic field. So some people feel that after their experience, they can no longer wear a wristwatch. It'll just stop working for them for some reason. They don't understand it, but it'll work for other people. Now, this could be an expensive watch. It could be a cheap watch. They just won't work for them anymore. Some people I know have actually taken their watches to the jewelers, and the jewelers can find nothing wrong with them. So there's that aspect which is fascinating. Some people feel that electrical items such as kettles, computers, toasters, credit card machines, that they'll all malfunction in their in their presence. They won't work for them for some reason. And actually I witnessed this as well back in 2006. I spoke at the International Association for Near-Death Studies, their conference in Houston, Texas. And at the beginning of the week, it was all the presentation of the scientific papers from the researchers. And towards the end of the conference, people who'd had a near-death experience actually spoke. And when they got up on the stage, the microphone failed for some reason. There'd been no technical hitches for the whole of the conference. But as soon as the people got up there, the microphone failed and the lights flickered as well. So I actually witnessed that. Um, and also what I've... Um, notice as well is that some people feel that they're more psychic after their experiences. Some people feel they can read minds of people, they can get premonitions, and they can pick up on what people are thinking about and what they're feeling. And then some people as well feel that they develop a healing ability where they're able to maybe put their hands over someone who has an ailment and that will resolve very quickly as a result of it. So there's lots of different things that um, that can come from these experiences. And the uh, their personalities can, can very much change, which is not something that just happens. Like people don't normally uh, have huge shifts in their personality uh, from – just about, I mean, it takes something like this to cause that type of an effect. Yes, it does. And there was some research undertaken, and they compared people who had had um, a close brush with death, who didn't have a near-death experience, with people who did have a near-death experience. And they found that there were changes in people who didn't have the near-death experience, but they were far more marked and profound in people who'd had the NDE. And um, there's lots of different uh, changes. You know, there's complete change of personality in some cases. People are motivated to change their careers, you know, whereas before they'd always been motivated to earn lots of money and they'd been quite materialistic. As a result of their near-death experience, because those values changed so much, it was simple things then that were more important to them. And um, so some people made career changes and gave up a high-paid job to go and work as a carer, for example. So it does have a really huge, profound effect on people. And in fact, the changes can be so marked that the, the spouse of the person no longer recognizes them. And it has been reported that there's a, quite a high divorce rate in people who, after they've had a near-death experience. And, and I believe it was Kenneth Ring's work where he said that uh, they also seem to have a jump in IQ. Ah, yes, he did some really interesting research as well. And he found, I think it was in his book, The Amiga Project, where yeah. he found that people were, yes, had this jump in IQ as well. 
And indeed, I've, I recently came across um, a lady last year. I spoke at a conference in Marseille in France, and I met this lady there, and her name is Raja ben -Amor. Now, during her near-death experience, it was very, very deep and extensive. And she went back, she had a life review to the time of her birth, but her, her review also went back to the time of the birth of the universe. But she also feels that she existed at a quantum level and that she gained this information and understanding of quantum physics. Now, she'd never had any teaching or training in quantum physics. And as a result of her near-death experience, she was then motivated to go and study it at university level. And what was interesting in this conference is that they'd interviewed her university professor. And he said that he was very puzzled by her deep knowledge of quantum physics, because it's not something that you could just get through doing a course in quantum physics over a year or so. It wasn't something that you could gain through just reading lots of books on the subject. This was like deep-seated knowledge. And in fact, some of the things that she'd written about in her papers, not even he understood, but he said they had since been verified by other publications in physics mm -hmm. journals. So that, to me, is really, really fascinating, how she could have this understanding of such a deeply complex subject. Now, when I first read The Omega Project, what Kenneth Ring did is compared the experience of near-death, or the near-death experience with the UFO abduction account and found a lot of similarities. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, there, there certainly do seem to be a lot of similarities. I, I don't know much about UFO um, cases, to be honest with you, but what I have read of them, there are certainly um, similarities there. And there's also people who have the UFO encounters have also reported disruptions in their electromagnetic field as well. So there could mm -hmm. be some links there as well that we don't quite understand. It, it seems like they both might be related to an altered state of consciousness that, that affects the physical body in a, in a very different way. Yes, that's right. And I think it's really important um, to consider these altered states of consciousness because, you know, up until quite recently, these have just been considered as kind of hallucinatory experiences, but it seems far more than that now. And I think more research that's being done is showing that these experiences do need to be considered in greater depth. The uh, the other thing about the, the UFO experience is that there are, and Whitley Strieber's been focusing on this uh, quite a bit, that dead relatives are seen sometimes during the uh, abduction experience. Oh, right. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. I don't know a great deal about the abduction experiences, but um, that's really interesting aspect as well, because, again, that would be in common with the people who have a near-death experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's And it's puzzling because they don't seem like they should be anything related Yes, that's right. You wouldn't think that at all because, you know, people are near death in one instance and they, they're not, well, they're not near death in the other. So, yeah. yeah. Um, now, you also studied some incidents of children having near-death experiences. And what can those tell us? Well, yeah, that's interesting because young children don't seem to have the concept of death that adults do. Yet they report experiences that are almost identical to adult near-death experiences. So that is really fascinating. You know, I came across um, one that I mentioned in my book, The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, that was reported to me by um, the, the, man's, the, the boy's father. And um, this happened when he was on the uh, army base in Berlin. And he said... His son had had an operation. He was on the operating table, and he suffered a cardiac arrest. Um, they did resuscitate him, and he survived. And he said a few weeks later, after he'd recovered, um, the man, his father had relief from um, a colleague who then, it meant that he could have a day off and spend time with his family. So he said to his son, what do you want to do for the day? Do you want to go anywhere? And his son, he was only about four at the time of his experience, and he said, yes, I'd like to go to the park. And his father said, well, what park is that? We haven't been to one. And he said, oh, the park that I went to when I was in the hospital. He said, the one through the tunnel. I went into this park through the tunnel, and there were people playing on swings, other children. But there was, I went to cross over the white gate but there was a man behind the gate who sent me back and said I, I couldn't come back I couldn't come in and he sent me back through the tunnel 
Now, the, the boy's father was really puzzled by this. He said, how could a four-year-old have such a concept and report something like this? So, obviously, for the, the young boy, it was something, it was a real experience for the young boy. And, and that was interesting because of his age, you know, just four years of age. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, he wasn't exposed to the concept of near-death experiences either. No, that's right. Um now, this point of no return is a common factor as well. Yes, it is. It could be anything. The point of no return, it could be a gate, it could be a river, it could be a doorway, anything like that, really. But the person knows that if they cross over this barrier, they won't return to life. And very often, you know, they're sent back as well by the relatives. The relatives, it's commonly said that it's not your time, you have to go back. So, um, yeah, that's a very common element. All right, we have to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Dr. Penny Sartori. So tonight we've been talking with Dr. Penny Sartori about her book, The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, How Understanding NDEs Can Help Us Live More Fully. And uh, do you want to talk about the second part of that title a little bit? Yes. Um, what I found is, with my research is that people were asking me, you know, what happens after we die then, you know, and I think... The thing that I've learned more through my research is how we can apply what these people are telling us into our everyday life. So I think after death, after the point of death, we won't really fully understand it until we experience it in its entirety when we actually die ourselves. But what these people are telling us does have a message for us, you know, and I think since studying near-death experiences, I've been profoundly affected as well. And it certainly changed the way that I perceive life and the way I live my life as well. And I think the underlying message of the near-death experience, and I find this is really important, is to treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And it's a lovely message. It's a, a message of peace and love and respect. And that is the message that's at the heart of every wisdom tradition as well and i think it's really important to take the, this on board as well and to be very mindful of the way that we do live our lives and i think you know a lot of people my friends and my colleagues always say to me gosh you know you're studying death isn't that morbid but i think it's when we really start study death it's when we really start to learn about life and so i've learned a great deal through doing my research as well do you, do you think it's that we just view death as such a uh, a negative thing rather than a natural thing? Yes, that's right. You know, we're very death-denying as a society. You know, we kind of push it to one side. We don't talk about it. We never contemplate it. We don't think it's ever going to happen to us or until something happens, you know, and it happens to a close loved one. And it's it's when we get these crisis points that we really do start to think about these issues. And uh, for me, you know, it was that it was that night looking after that patient who was clearly dying that really did make me think more about death. If I hadn't had that encounter with the patient, I probably still wouldn't be thinking about death. So it's something that I look at as a blessing as well because it's opened my eyes to so many things and having the benefit of doing this research it's made me really happy in my life now as well one of the things you talk about in the book that i found kind of interesting was the effect uh that when someone dies sometimes there'll be light seen or they'll start glowing yes there's um some of my colleagues used to have these um intuitions and perhaps experiences when someone was dying. For example, one of my colleagues used to feel cold around the bedside. She could feel cold spots and she would predict that a patient was going to die. And every time she had this prediction, the patient would die within a few hours. Um, some people pick up on different smells as well. And um, some people see things, you know, I've had reports of people seeing like a mist around the body. I've never actually seen anything myself. But um, I, do, I have had many reports about it. And um, sometimes as well there's things like electrical malfunctions around the bedside as patients die as well. And um, sometimes, you know, lights can flicker and things like that. And um, a friend of mine, went, shortly after her grandmother died, for example, um, she'd gone to her house and they'd locked up after her, uh, closed all the lights off. And then they had to go back to another place. And as they drove back past their grandmother's house, there was a light on. And 
there was no explanation as to how that light had come on, you know. So some people get sort of um, experiences like that after death as well. And what's very commonly reported after someone dies is clocks stopping at the time of death. And um, in the last few weeks, actually, I've I've had someone write to me and um, she said that when her husband had died, they had three different clocks in different rooms and each clock had all stopped at the, the exact time of his death. So that's really quite fascinating to me. You also talk about something having to do with birds. Yes, yeah, sometimes people see birds just before someone dies. And in fact, this actually happened um, a few days before my grandmother died. We nursed her in a, her home and um, someone had used the, the bathroom in the night and um, there was no window open, the door was closed. And in the morning, they went back in to use the bathroom and the window was still closed and there was a, a bird flying around in that bathroom. They had to open the window and uh, let the bird out. And uh, my gran actually died about uh, two days later. And it's commonly reported things like that, that death, um, birds can be the harbinger of death. So, yeah. Right, right. And that, that's a common mythological type of a, of a thing yes, in different cultures. That, that's right, yes. Now, you want to explain to people what the shared death experience is? Yeah, the shared death experience is fascinating as well. Now, this is when people at the bedside can have or share in a partial journey into the light with a dying person. Um, I'll give you an example of this. The first one I came across was a man who called me up at the university because he'd had this experience, which was really very vivid to him and significant to him, but he couldn't understand it. And he said that when his wife was dying in the hospital, him and his daughter and his son were at her bedside. And he said her her breathing started to change and they knew that death was coming soon. And his daughter was at the, the top of her body and she was stroking her forehead and he was at the side holding her hand and the son was at the foot of the bed and he said all of a sudden my daughter said look can you see mum she's on a path with some people and he said all of a sudden it's as if a kind of vision opened up before him and he was alongside his wife and they were on a path and at the end of the path was a group of people and in front of them was a, a big tall man standing with his arms outstretched and behind these people there was a light and he said he walked so far with his wife but then he couldn't go any further and then he watched his wife going towards this man and he gave her a really warm loving welcoming embrace and he said it was such a profound experience and he said I just felt so much joy, so much peace that he'd never felt before. And he said all of a sudden then the vision started to fade and he found himself sitting next to his wife who had just died. And he said what should have been the saddest day of his life because his wife had just died turned out to be an experience of somewhat elation. And he said I'm sure the nurses must have thought that we were quite insensitive because we had these big smiles on our faces because of what we'd experienced. So him and his daughter both experienced that vision, but the son didn't experience anything. So that is one example. And also people can be separated by great miles, great distance as well, and still have similar experiences. And another example of this is a lady called Annie Cap, And she contacted me a good few years ago now because her mother was dying in hospital in Oregon and Annie was living in the UK and she said she was um, she's a therapist and she was treating a client and she was suddenly overcome by breathlessness and like a coughing and she was coughing a lot and she was making this terrible breathing sound and she had to terminate her session with the client and she said she intuitively knew that she should phone her mum. So she phoned her mum, who was in hospital in Oregon, and she got through to her room, and Annie's sister answered the phone. And she said, I'm glad you've called, because mum is not very well. She's deteriorated very suddenly, and her 
that she's taken a turn for the worst. And in the background, Annie could hear her mum, and her mum was having breathing problems, and she had fluid on the lungs. And as soon as Annie connected with her mum, and she spoke all over the phone to her mum, her mum couldn't speak back, but she spoke. And she said as soon as she spoke to her mum, Annie's symptoms subsided. So it's almost as if Annie had those symptoms, even though she was thousands of miles away from where her mother was. So that's another kind of empathic or shared death experience. And what Mm. interests me about these experiences, particularly the first example I gave, was that the people at the bedside, they were not close to death and their brains were not dysfunctional. So if it's just to do with a dysfunctional brain, it doesn't explain how people at the bedside can have these experiences as well. So that is another thing that makes it equally fascinating. And, and one of the other things you talk about that, that's fascinating is the, uh, the lucidity that sometimes happens in, in like Alzheimer's patients and, and the like. Yes, that's right. That, this is becoming more commonly reported now as well. And since um, publishing my book, and I have a few examples of this in my book, a lot of other people have written to me as well to say that's happened and they've noticed that to a relative of theirs as they were dying. So people who have this um, Alzheimer's, maybe they're not lucid and they've been unable to hold a coherent conversation for many years or even months. And all of a sudden, just before they die, it's as if they become lucid again and they're able to have a conversation which is quite clear and lucid. So that, to me, is really fascinating because, you know, if the Alzheimer's is due to degeneration of the brain, how come they can have a a really lucid experience? It would suggest that perhaps consciousness overrides the actual functioning of the brain. So one of the the big questions I guess a lot of people have is that not everyone has a near-death experience. So why would some people, this happen to some people and not others? I know that is something that we really don't understand at the moment. Um, One thing that I, I think is worth exploring further is the possibility that people perhaps do have an experience, but they're not able to recall it. And the reason I say this is because about 10 years ago, a lady wrote to me and she'd been attacked in her home and she'd been left for dead. And she remembers being attacked and then just as she was punched and knocked out, she remembers that and she remembers being uh, fallen to the floor. And then she doesn't remember anything else. She just remembers waking up in hospital a few days later. And she said that about um, about six months later, eight months later, she had to go back into hospital because she had a, her nose was broken in the attack and she had to go back and have an operation to reset her nose. And she said as soon as she went under anaesthetic, she went back to the time when she was assaulted. It was as if she was reliving the whole event. But this time when she landed on the floor unconscious, she left her body and she went, she was looking down at it all. And then she went through a tunnel towards a, um, a bright light. And she ha- had a full on near death experience. Now, she didn't recall that initially when she was attacked, but this was something that she recalled about six months later when she was anaesthetized. So that is something that makes me think well, perhaps everyone has the experience, but not everyone is able to recall it. Well, I think, too, that. Uh... It may also, you know, it's an altered state of consciousness, I would I would say, um, kind of like a dream. And there are some people who will insist that they don't ever dream, but we know that everybody dreams. It's just a matter of recall. And it might be that the experience just isn't compatible with a normal state of consciousness in some people. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's a really good point. It could well be that. So we, we really don't know enough, really, at this point. So it just shows, you know, we're just kind of scratching the surface with all of the research that's been undertaken so far. So I think, you know, there's a lot more research to, to continue with, really. Now, the, the experience someone has when they die, uh, in the near-death experience at least, does it fit what they believe deep down, or does it fit what they believe on the surface? Well, I think it's a combination of both, really, um, because there's a lot of things that people experience that they've been brought up, you know, even if they don't necessarily believe in these things. So, for example, from a religious perspective, we're still brought up with these images of perhaps Jesus and Mary around us. And so I think there's a lot of things in 
the, the subconscious mind of people as well, which have been instilled in them from the time that they're small children, really. So I think some of it is influenced by what they actually believe and also some of it from the subconscious imagery as well, which is stored there. Okay, so now when uh, the more materialistic skeptic, the more closed-minded skeptic looks at this situation, they have a, a lot of different explanations as to what's happening. Obviously, hallucination is one. Um, you, want, you want to get into some of these and why they don't work? Yeah, well, for example, let's start with hallucinations. Now, in the intensive care unit, lots of patients hallucinate. You know, it's so common to see patients hallucinate. So what I did with my research is that I documented some cases of patients who'd been hallucinating, and then I investigated them as well. And what I found is that there were, there were big marked differences with the two kinds of experiences. So when I followed up people who had been hallucinating, they were very embarrassed by their behavior. They could, you know, they remembered what they were doing. They were actually acting bizarrely and irrationally. Perhaps sometimes they became aggressive towards the nurses. They tried to get out of bed or remove their tubes and things like that. And very often what they were hallucinating was very random and bizarre. And when I investigated them in depth, it was all attributable to things that were going on in the background. So, for example, they could hear the, the staff conversations, they could hear the noises, maybe the alarms going off in the background, all the things that were happening as they were coming round from sedation. And when I followed them up after six months, they could rationalise that they'd been hallucinating. And when I followed up the patients who'd had the near-death experience, they didn't display that irrational behavior. They were all deeply unconscious as this experience was happening. And when I interviewed them six months later, they remained adamant that that experience was very real. It was realer than real. And they said that unless you'd experienced it for yourself, you couldn't possibly understand it. So there was a marked difference, really, with the hallucinations and with the near-death experience. Also, as well, another explanation for them is that it's due to lack of oxygen. And, um, again, this is a really plausible um, explanation for them, and that was something I wanted to investigate with my research. And what I found was that some patients had the near-death experience, but their oxygen levels were normal. Now, there was one case in particular he had a near-death experience during the time when he was deeply unconscious. He was connected to the ventilator, so he was receiving large amounts of oxygen. And at the time of his experience, a sample of blood had been extracted and his oxygen levels were normal. In fact, they were higher than normal. Um, so it couldn't be due to lack of oxygen there. Also, things like lack of um, low, high levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. Again, there was a patient in my study who had a, a normal level of carbon dioxide at the time of their near-death experience. I also looked at drugs because, you know, we give patients highly potent drugs in the intensive care unit. We give them things like morphine and fentanyl and a combination of these. And what I found is that, if anything, the drugs that we gave to the patients had an inhibitory quality. So it made any, any kind of experience into a confusional experience, which was in stark contrast to the very clear and lucid and precise near-death experience. So it doesn't seem to be attributable to the usual kind of things that were, have been suggested as explanations. And, and you said uh, that drugs definitely have a, a dulling effect, like the more lo less likely to have a near-death experience while they're on any kind of major uh, drugs. Yeah, um, they can still have the experience, but what I found was that, you know, in the first year when I interviewed every single patient who'd been through the intensive care unit, now a huge percentage of these patients were on drugs, uh, drugs like uh, morphine and fentanyl and things like that, yet there was less than 1% of that sample actually reported a near-death experience. So if it was due to the drugs, I would expect a higher frequency of the near-death experience. And uh, one of the other explanations is that it's something called gravitational induced loss of consciousness. Yes, that's right. This is something that is um, reported by pilots during their training. So they put them in the centrifuge and they're exposed to vast um, acceleration where they become quite, um, the, the brain, there's lack of oxygen there and they become unconscious. 
And, you know, there have been studies then which show that there are some similarities to the near-death experience reported, but there are also some differences as well. And there's a great example which was um, reported by Dr. Peter Fennick in his book, um, in the truth in the, li- the light, and he describes the near-death experience of an air airline pil- uh, air force pilot, and he's had both the near-death experience and also um, was unconscious due to altitude as well. So he remarked on the, the contrast between both experiences as well. So it seems that there's, although there are similarities, there are differences as well. Okay. Now, people also will point to uh, Persinger's God Helmet and how it uh, stimulates electric uh, currents through the brain and uh, can sometimes emulate near-death experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this is one way perhaps of um, triggering an experience as well. So I think there are very various different routes to access in these altered states of consciousness. But I think they kind of vary according to the context, really. And I think people who have the near-death experience are more profoundly transformed because the context is slightly different. So, for example, with Persinger's um, uh, subject, they had some form of expectation. They were part of an experiment, and there was some form of expectation as to what they would experience as well. Whereas with the near-death experience, it's very spontaneous. And you can't plan to have an experience. It's something that takes people unawares, really. So the difference in context as well. Now, I believe you said that some of the people uh, that were in the God Helmet experiment weren't actually having any kind of electrical electrical stimulation when they had their experiences. Um, Yeah, some people... um, I can't remember that part of the book, to be honest with you. But... uh, (laughs) Yes, yeah, so there was some, some other research has been done as well by um, a Swiss team who tried to replicate that, and and they um, believed that expectation had a lot of a big part to play in the experience in the experiment and as to what people reported as well. Well, how does it make you feel when you when you see some of these very close-minded skeptics, which are more debunkers than skeptics, just dismissing near-death experiences without doing any of the real research behind it? I know that's a shame. That is because you know they, they it's almost like they have these preconceived ideas, and you know they really should take the time to do their own research for a start because that shows how how really complex the experience is and also to speak with the people who've had the experience you know they are the real experts they've had this experience and i think once you start learning from these people and really engaging with them you can see the effects that these people that these experiences have on people you know the people who've had the near-death experience, they're not making this up. This is something that has really happened to them. And um, I think we have a lot to learn from them. So I think it, it's it's a bit disrespectful to be just so sceptical and not take the time to engage with these people as well. Um, one of the other things that tends to come up uh, is uh, DMT. And the possibility that DMT has something to do with these experiences. I know Rick Straussman did a did a bunch of research and showed that some of the uh, people who were injected with DMT had some similar experiences to near death experiences, although different. They had some of the similar elements. Yes, that's right, and that was great work. Rick Strassman's work and his book, uh, The Spirit Molecule, is absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, you know, he again came across people who had very uh, quite similarities with the near-death experience as well. But again, there were some in his research that who, um, I think it was a lady called Willow, um, who had an experience which was very quite similar to the near-death experience. But she'd also been reading a lot of books on near-death experiences at the time. So again, I think, you know, the it's an altered state of consciousness. It's a way to attain an altered state of consciousness. But again, the context is slightly different, which is perhaps why the, the content of the actual experience was not 100% like a near-death experience, although there were similarities there. So I think the, the people who were part of the um, DMT experiment entered into the study with, again, some form of expectation. Okay. Um, Now, one of the things you you go over is some of the differences in culture and near-death experiences, like people in other cultures who have been brought up and completely different from the Western 
belief system have different types of near-death experiences. Yes, that's right. So, um, for example, people in India, they meet up with, uh, in fact, there was a really good study done by Osis and Haraldson uh, with deathbed visions of people who were were close to death. And with with the Western cases, people were very um, happy to go with people as they were, you know, the people that they met during the experience, whereas people in India were, were very resistant to, to go in with the dead relatives or um, the Yamaduts, who were the messengers of the god of the dead. So the, the experiences are very much culturally influenced, and, you know, the, the different cultures have different imagery as well. So the kind of um, experiences were very much influenced by their culture. And so, so it's, it seems like the actual experience is somewhat morphic. It, 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 it may have like the same archetype base behind it, but the actual elements are, can be so very different. Yes, that's right. They, they can be completely different, you know, whereas perhaps in um, the West there's that life review and people actually relive their life in a matter of seconds. For example, again, in India, they meet up with Chitragupta, who is the man with a book of deeds. And in this book of deeds, it has a list of everything that the person has done during their life. So, again, that's very similar, but um, portrayed in a slightly different way, really. It's, it's showing the same thing. It perhaps has the same purpose as the life review, but it's actually um, experienced in a different way. Now, these experiences are, are more common during cardiac arrest, aren't they? Yes, they are. Um, they occur in between 11 and 20% of people who've had a cardiac arrest. And with the hospital research that I did, for the first year, I interviewed everyone. So that's not only cardiac arrest patients, it's people who are all in the intensive care unit for some reason or other. Now, not all of these came close to death. And so not many people reported the experience. It was less than 1%. But then for the following four years, I concentrated only on the survivors of cardiac arrest. And what I found was that um, 18% of the survivors of cardiac arrest reported a near-death experience. So that was a marked increase, really. So it shows that the closer one gets to death, the more likely they are to report an experience. Okay. Um, someone has suggested, too, <clears throat> that people are more likely to talk about this stuff right after it happens, and oftentimes we don't get to talk to the patients right after they come back. Yeah, that's right. Um, that, that's what I tried to do with my research is as soon as they'd recovered from their, their unconsciousness or their cardiac arrest, um, I went and I interviewed them as soon as possible. And um, indeed, I found that some people remembered things, some people didn't. And But there were some cases where I wasn't able to speak to the patients, um, maybe for a couple of days. And there was one lady, I didn't speak to her for 17 days, yet she remembered very vividly what had happened during her experience. So... Um, I think it is important to interview them as soon as possible. And I also found as well is that um, if I wasn't able to interview them um, in depth, some some patients initially reported a near-death experience, but they died before I was able to follow up and do an in-depth interview. So it was important to interview the patients as soon as possible. Now, if someone has a near-death experience and they, they end up in another situation like that, are they likely to have another? Yes, there are people who've had multiple experiences. Um, but again, there's people who haven't had multiple experiences. So it, it, it varies, really, and there's no way of predicting, really, if they will have another one. Okay, all right. Um, now, one of the other really interesting things about after effects is the cases of spontaneous healing. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's something that really fascinates me. Um, the patient 10, who I mentioned earlier on, who had the out-of-body experience, which was very accurate. Now, his case is fascinating because he also, after the out-of-body experience, he went upwards into a pink room. He met his dead father and his dead mother-in-law, who he'd never met, but he recognized her from photographs. 
And he also met a, a figure, and he said to me, I'm not sure who this other man was. He said, it could have been Jesus, but it's not what I expected Jesus to look like, because this man had long, scruffy hair that needed a good comb in. And he said he also had some very bright, piercing eyes, and he was drawn to look at his eyes. And um, he was happy where he was. He wanted to stay there. But the Jesus figure said, no, it's not your time. You have to go back. And uh, he ended back in his, bod- up in his body, and uh, he made a recovery. Now, the interesting thing about this case is that that man, at the time of his experience, was 60 years old, and he has cerebral palsy. So from the time of his birth, his right hand had been in a permanently contracted position where he'd never been able to open out his hand and he'd never had the full use of his hand. And when I was following him up about um, doing the interview, he misunderstood one of the questions that I asked. And I asked him, when you were out of your body, was there anything that you could do that you can't normally do? And he looked at me and he said, oh, yeah, he said, look at my hand. I can open it out. And he opened out his right hand right in front of me. And at the time, I didn't really realize the significance of this. And I discussed this with the doctors and the physiotherapists. And they both said that that shouldn't physiologically be possible because his tendons would have been in a permanently contracted position. So the only way to open out his hand would be to have an operation to release the tendons. Well, no such operation was performed. And so we really don't understand how this could have happened. So that is something that is really fascinating. But if we understood it and if we understood the mechanism behind it, we could really benefit thousands of other patients who have similar ailments and they could have treatment without having operations as well. So it would save lots of money as well. And and there was a woman who had cancer as well that almost died from it and had a complete remission of it, correct? Yeah, this is the case of um, Anita Mojani who's written a book about her experience. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about this on the internet. And... um, She had uh, lymphoma and she was in the intensive care unit and she was um, really sick and not expected to survive and the doctor had kind of warned her family that death was imminent and um, yet as she was losing consciousness, as she was dying, she had this near-death experience which has completely changed her life and it's given her a completely different understanding on her life and given her insights. And as a result, she lives her life in a totally different way. And as she says in her book, she made a very quick recovery. And uh, and now, if you look at her, she's the picture of health, you know. So um, that's one example of um, a spontaneous healing. And there's many more as well, you know. And that that flies in the face of this being a an experience that is... Uh... Uh, a, a defect, I guess you could say, because it seems to have mostly positive results on people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's, it's as if it shifts everyone's consciousness when they have this experience. And so, if you like, it's almost as if they're kind of reborn. You know, the person who they were no longer exists and they're living life in a, in a completely different way now as a result of what they've learned. Now, you find people walking away from this healthier, uh, with a better moral standing, with a better appreciation of life, uh, sometimes with higher IQs and a more spiritual outlook, and you'll you'll have the debunkers saying, well, it's just a hallucination. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, you know, if, if, you, if you think about it, you know, all of these really positive benefits and the after effects, if you could put that into a pill, it would be, you know, hailed as a wonder drug, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, we're almost done here, but I wanted to ask you a couple more things real quick. Um, you were talking about different ideas of death through the ages, like how they've changed over time, and you can see it in artwork and stuff like that. Do you think these views of death were the result of near-death experiences, or could those ideas of death actually be creating the archetype the, the visuals that we see when we have the near-death experience? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, is it is, uh, what can face the chicken or the egg kind of thing? And, um, yeah, I think probably what has happened is that the people who have actually had these kind of experiences and then they've depicted it in the, the artwork as well and also through the oral tradition of storytelling, which was very common as well in years gone by. So I think it's, it's things, I think there are, 
they're based on real experiences of people and it's just kind of um, depicted then in the artwork and communicated that way as well. Okay. Uh, has, has there been anything new since you've published this book that has uh, uh, been significant to you? Um, this, well, since my book came out, it, it's been incredible, really. The amount of emails and letters that I've had from people from all over the world, it's phenomenal. I'm still trying to reply to my emails, so if there's anyone listening and they haven't had a reply, I will get round to it. It's just that I've, I've been bombarded, and I think... What I've realized now is that these experiences are far... I knew that they were underreported before, but now I realize that they are far more common than I ever anticipated. You know, there are so many people out there who've had this experience, and they've all been afraid to talk about it. And I've had people saying to me, you know, at, at last I feel like I'm able to talk about my experience. I don't feel so isolated anymore. So I think it's breaking down barriers in that people now are more willing to talk about the experience. And I know in the local, in in the press in the UK, after my book came out, there were a lot of people who were willing to have their photographs taken and talk about their experience. Now, 20 years ago, when I began researching this, this phenomenon, it was very difficult to find anyone who would even share their experience with me, let alone talk about it publicly. So I think people are now understanding the value of these experiences, and so people are less sceptical, which is then encouraging people who've had the experience to talk about it. And um, there, there's a few developments, really, that I want to take forward following the publication of my book. And um, in the UK, we're setting up a support group for people who've had the near-death experience. There is a lady called Gigi Strala who has done a lot and she set up the website and she's initiated some meetings in London as well. So if there's anyone in the UK or anyone away who wants to, you know, come and join us on these meetings, have a look at the website. The website is www neardeathexperienceuk.com and we're hoping that these meetings are going to build up a, a big support group of people who can then share the experience and feel that they're supported while describing the experience as well. So um, that is one thing that we'd like to do. Okay. Um, you also pushed for the, the idea of integrating these experiences better with people because you say that when people don't get to uh, talk about them and integrate them into their lives, it can actually do some damage. Yes, that's right. You know, it can. when people have the experience, first of all, it's taken a and if they talk to someone about it, it's taken a lot of courage for them to talk about the experience. So the reaction that they get is very important. So it's important that we listen to the person and let them express everything that they're feeling. If they're met with a dismissive attitude that, oh, that was a hallucination or it was due to the drugs, that can really have a detrimental effect on the person. You know, they'll close up, they won't ever want to talk about it again. And in fact, some people go years and years and years without ever talking about it. Yet they know inside them that they've had the most profound experience that they can ever have. But they're so isolated because there's no one they can talk to about the experience. And so that is really one of the reasons why we set up this support group in the UK, because it's so important. And I think, you know, in America, the International Association of Near-Death Studies has many support groups and they have different regional support groups. And again, that's something that we're trying to do in the UK as well. Okay. Um... What about suicides? Are the near-death experience of suicides different? They can be, yeah. Well, they, they're quite similar. Some people have the, the usual common experience. Some people have more of a distressing experience. But what I've noticed is that after the ex experience, if they've had a near-death experience during the suicide attempt, it gives the person a completely different perspective. And very often they don't ever want to attempt suicide again it it makes them realize that suicide is not an escape if they've got problems they take their problems where they are so it's about resolving them in this life and sometimes they have the insight as well that what they perceive to be a, a big problem perhaps in the great in the grand scale of things isn't as bad as what they feared and um, and so sometimes it can put them off ever attempting suicide again 
Okay. Um, ideally, what would you like people to take away from your work? Well, I think I'd like people to sort of engage with the near-death experience and not to view death as such a, a taboo subject and not to be afraid of it and really to help for them to start contemplating these things and how they can apply it in their own life you know i think you know as i've said before it's when we start to study death that we really start to learn about life and i think that's been a big impact for me and that's what it's it's taught me in my life is how i can apply these things to my life and whereas before i was always con you know, very much consumed with um, small things. I'd worry about simple things. And then I, I used to be, you know, I'd, I'd be quite materialistic and competitive. All of a sudden, those things that once had value in my life no longer have that same value. It's simple things for me, you know, about spending time with my family and, um, you know, showing love and respect for other people as well. All right. Do, do you have a website? I do. It's com, And I also have a, a blog, and that's com. Okay. And you have a conference coming up that you're going to be speaking at. Yes, that's right. Um, I've got some speaking events coming up. Um, in November, on the 8th and 9th of November, I'll be speaking at the Gateways of the Mind Conference, and that's in Notting Hill in London. Okay. Uh, and then what are you going to be speaking? Are you just going to be talking about near-death experiences? Yes, the, the whole conference really is very much focused on the subject of death and near-death experiences. There's other great speakers there. There's Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, there's Dr. Peter Fenwick, oh. uh, and there's lots of other people from different cultures as well. So it's going to be a great conference, and I, I'm, I think I'm going to learn a lot more as well. All right. Well, once again, the book is The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, How Understanding NDEs Can Help Us Live More Fully. Um, what's the best place for, for people to pick this up? Um, you can get that from anywhere. You can get it from um, Amazon. You can get it from Cygnus Books in the UK. And uh, you can get it from any bookshop as well. All right. I thank you so much. This work is absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend everyone read this book. Um, it's just, it's one of the best books on near-death experiences I've ever read. And I thank you so much for doing this work. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your comments. They're very kind. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And, you know, the, the work is fascinating, and I've really enjoyed doing it. Thank you, Penny. That's okay. You're welcome.